green mm-hmm. going live and then it'll say live so hi everybody welcome welcome happy monday actually happy end of monday so this is a good day this is a very good day i'm claire I'm claire wasserman i am the founder of ladies get paid i'm also the author of ladies get paid which just came out in january a little bit about ladies get paid for you all who maybe you're not familiar uh, we are an educational platform we are a global community of almost 100,000 women, and we are all about helping women level up professionally, financially. We want you to get rich. We want you to get power. We want you to help close the wage gap and the leadership gap and the investment gap. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Question for everybody who's here attending. Go in the chat. Where are you guys calling in from? Where are you from? And also, I think we're at maybe six. Uh, number six of all of our events for this finance festival. So if you came to a panel before this, you came to our opening workshop, presumably you liked it because you're, you're back. So, you know, tell us in the chat what you liked about it, what you learned, and a little piece of exciting news from us before I get into the introduction and the welcome of our panel today. Two pieces of exciting news. Number one, we were at the New York Times this Sunday. Uh, a journalist came to one of our events. It was the Bitcoin event. Curious who who came to that. She wrote about it. Uh, really exciting. And we're going to be putting up every one of our panels on our YouTube channel. So stay tuned for that. Um, and the other second exciting announcement that I have is our closing keynote, keynote on Wednesday. It is the U.S. Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo, which is really exciting. She had been the first female governor of Rhode Island and obviously working on the big infrastructure plan that President Biden has put in place, helping women get back to work. So we we like that very much. Thank you to our partners. I'm going to thank them and then I promise I will let our panelists actually speak. But first, panel, uh, first our, our partner, Public, public.com. They are an app that helps you invest in companies that you believe in. Um, they also have a social network where you can share what companies you're investing in. You can learn from the other people in the network. We also have free money for you if you sign up. So Ashley is going to drop in the link in the chat where you can get $25. Um, it's pinned to the top of the chat, I'm being told. Good, even easier. Um, our other partner is Lolly. Lolly gives you free Bitcoin when you shop online at places like Sephora and Macy's and Nike. So if you've ever been interested in investing in Bitcoin, but you're a little bit worried uh, about you know, putting in your own money, this is actually really good because you're spending the money at stores that you would normally spend your money at and they're just giving you cash back, but it's Bitcoin. So that's a great way to get started. Uh, dip your toe in the Bitcoin water. And then our final partner is The Balance. Uh, the Balance makes personal finance easy to understand. So any questions that you have about uh, financial literacy, normally we'd Google these things. You can just go directly to The Balance. That is my number one source to learn all things money. All right, let me go ahead and introduce our panel and our panelists. Uh, well, first, this is about how to get yourself on the cap table as an investor. And if you're not sure what a cap table is, you are absolutely at the right place. They're gonna break down a lot of that language. Uh, but first of all, when you close your eyes and you think about what an investor looks like, maybe it's a vest, like a Patagonia fleece vest. Maybe it's a bro, it's a man, it's, um, is people who don't look like us. That's why there's an investment gap, both in terms of those who invest capital and also for companies, for, for women who are starting businesses and seeking investment. I also want us to maybe get outside of this idea of you have to be very wealthy to invest. There's a lot of different forms that investment can take, whether it's you know angel investing or crowdfunding. Uh, so our panelists are gonna talk about kind of the, the scope of what investment can be and, and what an investor can look like. So first, uh, we have Cheryl Campos, who is the head of venture growth and partnerships at Republic, which is a one stop shop for founders to raise capital from both accredited and non accredited investors. Uh, Cheryl is also one of the founders of VC Familia, a community of uh, Latinx VCs supporting current and emerging investors through collaboration. I love that. Uh, Leah Fessler is the senior investment associate at Next View Venture. Uh, this is based in the New York office. So 
Most recently, before joining NextView, uh, she led editorial and brand voice at Chief, which is a private network for executive women. Um, Paula Herrera, she is uh, she helps businesses, small businesses, accomplish their strategic and operational goals. Uh, she is also an early stage investor in a handful of consumer companies in categories that excite her. So I'm curious what those categories are. Uh, and then our, our moderator, Koki Hasiotis, I think I got her name. Uh, she is the founder and CEO of Lasagna Consulting, uh, the US's first and only uh, BAAS consulting service, working with banks, infrastructure providers, so that's sort of connected to our keynote on Wednesday, uh, and brands at every stage of their BAAS journey. Clearly, I don't know what BAAS stands for, so I will definitely be watching this panel. I want Koki to take this away in a minute and tell me exactly what that means. Um, I also want to say that she is the chief of staff at The Block and an advisor for FinTech today. Ah, there we go. Did I get it all right, ladies? I said yes. Good. Awesome. Thank you all so much for being here. Everybody watching, I hope you'll join us uh, tomorrow for a next event called So You Want to Be a Founder. So this is for folks who are interested in maybe starting companies. So you're seeing this part of the table, this side of the table today, but come back tomorrow. Uh, and Ashley's going to put in the link to RSVP without further ado. Welcome, welcome, Koki, Paula, Leah, and Cheryl. Enjoy the panel, everybody watching. Put in your questions in the Q&A tab if you can. Um, our panelists will also be checking the chat. Have a wonderful panel and I'll be I'll see you on the other side. Thanks, Claire. Thanks so much. Um, so great to be here. Thank you so much. The ladies get paid for having us. This is super exciting and a topic I'm particularly passionate about. And I know these women are as well. Uh, so very excited to dive in. Um, first, I want to give you three the opportunity to uh, to talk to us a little bit about who you are and why you invest. Um, so let's start with you, Cheryl. Yeah, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Super exciting, and especially something that I'm so passionate about is really empowering folks to make sure that they uh, start investing and start investing early because time is on your side. So um, brief background on me, I'm a native New Yorker, even though right now I'm in LA. Uh, so um, we, uh, we're essentially starting to travel again, but still nostalgic for New York. So uh, I was just listening to it in the Heights soundtrack. So. Fun fact about me, um, I uh, graduated from Harvard with a major in economics and I did the whole IBPE route. Um, as you can probably already tell, my personality is not suited for that. I'm much more of uh, just kind of someone who, who uh, is entrepreneurial. And so joining Republic in 2018 um, was, incredible for me because it was a mission of democratizing access to an asset class that was previously solely for accredited investors. For those of you who don't know, there are accreditation laws that essentially say that if you uh, don't have a worth of over a million dollars or you know income of over 200K um, a year, um, you can't invest in startups because they think it's too high risk. Um, there are now, they've changed a little bit of the laws, but that's essentially the gist of it. And that really locked out about, you know, 93% of America. So um, it was something that uh, I had no idea about. But when I heard that this was some finally like, non-accredited investors could finally invest in startups through a regulated platform, uh, I was like, this is the future. And I asked for a job <laughs> and I got it. So that was great. Um, uh, since then, you know, uh, we've helped over 250 companies raise over 150 million. Um, and we have about a million people on the platform. So it's super exciting to see how much it's grown. And essentially, you know, you can invest in startups, which is a high risk, but high reward um, opportunity. And I can get a little bit more into that. So that's a little bit about me, a little bit about uh, Republic. I'll put some, you know, links in the chat, but I wanna make sure that the other beautiful panelists uh, can, can speak as well. And uh, I'm super excited to meet you, by the way, Cheryl. I'm a huge Republic stan, so like this is dope. <laughs> I'm like super Wait, excited. I love it, I love it, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm like a massive stan, I, I'm obsessed with it. Um, same opportunity, let me open that up to Leah, how about you? Hey, nice to see everyone. So glad to see some familiar faces. Cheryl, one of my favorite people in venture investing from day one and some new friends in Koki and Paula. Um, and hello to everybody here. Um, I am calling in from my parents' basement as it is the day after my brother's <laughs> wedding. But every other day of the pandemic, pretty much, I've been in, uh, in Clinton Hill, Brooklyn. So 
Um, big fan of New York. I've been there for about six years since graduating um, from Middlebury in 2015. I was an English and creative writing major, had absolutely no interest in finance, knew nothing about finance, uh, had never taken an economics or finance class. I uh, was recruited to work at Bridgewater Associates right out of school, which is the largest hedge fund uh, by assets in the US with a very strange culture of radical transparency. Still not sure why they recruited me, um, but I needed to pay off college loans, which is something that we can all talk about. So I went there, took a good uh, salary, and I was there for about a year in management. And then uh, from there on out, worked as a journalist uh, at Quartz in the Atlantic, covered the intersection of gender, race, and technology. And um, that's really where I became pretty passionate about early stage investing and supporting early stage founders. Um, I got into venture by reporting on how sexist, racist, and horrible venture is. Um, so I have been on the other side of that uh, article more often than not. Um, and, you know, I was one of the first reporters to cover Arlen Hamilton and Backstage Capital. And meeting those people just got me, you know, I'd never realized that I could actually take part in investing and I could do this work myself and help, uh, you know, empower people that otherwise were not getting checks. Um, and so that's kind of how I started. Um, I've been an angel in a couple of companies and I was not accredited for sure when I made those investments. So we can talk about those loopholes, uh, but in Ethel's Club, Somewhere Good, a kid's, get, a kid's book about and um, House. So I'm excited to share that they've all gone on to raise Series A. Uh, which is which is awesome thus far. And then, yeah, after working as journalist, led uh, uh, editorial and brand at Chief, was the 10th employee there, so got to see that early stage experience. And now, um, yeah, at Next Few Ventures, we're a generalist seed stage fund supporting founders pretty much across the board. Yeah, at that earliest stage. Thanks so much, Leah. Paul, you wanna hop in? Sure, can you hear me all right? Okay, you guys are hard to, to follow, but I'll do my best. So my name is Paula Herrera. I'm calling, I'm also from uh, living in Brooklyn, New York. Um, I'm in our building's kind of weird office space that has housed my husband for the past, you know, 14 months or so. Um, I went to Michigan undergrad, studied business there, right out of college, uh, worked in management consulting in the healthcare and higher education space. Um, consulting was a, was a wonderful training ground, but by no means, um, my passion. Uh, from there, I went to business school at Penn. I was uh, at Wharton and in the Lauder Institute, which is a um, master's in international studies. So I kind of shifted a little bit there and in, into LATAM and um, the entrepreneurship space. Um, that's where my love for brands kind of really grew. And uh, out, of, out of business school, I started working with um, Latin American artisans, mostly in Colombia and Mexico, and um, built a brand until the former pandemic hit, which was um, the Zika virus, which, you know, we've now it's a whole different dialogue. But um, I was pregnant with my first daughter at the time, um, so shifted away from quarterly travels to Latin America and um, toward helping brands grow. So um, definitely a different background than my two fellow panelists here. Um, from an investing standpoint, I, like I said, uh, just come to love brands and kind of stalk them until I can be a part of them in some capacity, whether that's on the consulting side, which I do currently um, kind of in brand strategy and operations space or investing in early stage companies, um, mostly in the consumer space. I can speak a little bit as to how I uh, choose those companies, um, but I get a ton out of backing an exciting new venture. I think it's um, definitely, there are, there are many ways currently that didn't exist in the past that you can get involved in a smaller scale. Um, so I'm happy to share a little bit about that and um, and encourage you all to get out there because it's, it's pretty fun. Thanks so much. And for all of you also, I'm Koki Hasiotis. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of Lasagna Technology. Um, I'm also a writer and advisor for FinTech Today. Um, please subscribe, it is my self-worth. Thank you very much. Um, I wrote a piece a while ago about angel investing generally, um, and how I'm trying to break down a lot of those barriers that weren't clear to me. And that's what I'm hoping to bring to this to this panel today is things I was like, what the hell am I supposed to do? And one of the big questions I wanted to answer is like, don't I have to be rich for this? Um, so I hope we'll get to cover that today. Um, but I think that's enough about me and enough about us. Let's let's get into the meat about of, of all of this, really. 
Um, can we start with some definitions? I want to explain like I'm five, please. Um, what's crowdfunding? Which one of you wants to take that? Feel free to jump in. Go ahead, Cheryl. This seems like you. Uh, I'll, I'll <laughs> hop in. Yes, this is right up my alley. So um, everyone kind of knows crowdfunding more as the Indiegogo's, Kickstarters of the world, and that's called rewards crowdfunding. And essentially it's like, hey, give and donate some money and you get a mug. Cool. <laughs> Except that, you know, when, for example, when Oculus raised their Kickstarter, um, you know, they, everyone who invested or donated got like a prototype. And then when they sold to Facebook for a billion dollars, they just had a prototype <laughs> that didn't even work anymore. So it's just kind of like, you know, imagine that you had invested early in a startup like that. That's what Republic does, right? We're equity crowdfunding, which we call crowd investing. Um, as a term or retail investing or private investing, what, whatever you want to call it. We still need to figure that out. That might be a whole nother poll. Um, but essentially what it is is that they are pre-seed all the way through series B companies on their platform where you can invest as little as $50 in a startup. Um, and that's monumental because for those of you who don't know, a lot of times, well, one, you need deal flow, which just means that you need to be seeing a lot of different deals and, and deciding then doing the diligence and seeing how you know if you want to invest in the company then you actually have to get an allocation so you have to actually get into the deal um and then for the most part like angel checks are like 25k 50k like a lot of money quite frankly um and so uh you know this is something where we make it accessible for anyone around the world to you know kind of like drops fill the bucket that this is something where it, it's harnessing the true power of numbers where founders can leverage their community, give them access to the ground floor of what they're building. Um, and, you know, in the future, I think that there's going to be a huge push around making sure that the community comes first. Um, so that's kind of what crowd investing is on the Republic side, um, which is why we want people to know about it, because I feel like the first five years really have been just about um, accessibility like awareness and education around it because people are just like oh wait crap isn't that in, like kickstarter and i'm like no <laughs> it is not and so um i hope that if you take anything away that you know it's that crowd investment exists yeah and the american market's kind of unusual here by the way um globally crowdfunding it looks a little bit more like how republic works with equity crowdfunding especially in the uk where it's very popular um, but we're a little bit behind on that. And I think we can. We can and the dive reason why, by the way, is because, yeah, Title III Jobs Act passed in 2016. So that finally allowed for Reg CF or crowdfund Reg crowdfunding to exist. Whereas out in Europe, it was in 2012, mm -hmm. I believe. So that's yeah. four years ahead of us. But you already see the results of it there of amazing companies that have, you know, gone on to do Series C, D, and, you know, there's going to be a lot of returns there. So. Tracking. Awesome. Yeah, we're going to turn back to crowdfunding um, after we're done with our uh, list of definitions. So can somebody tell me what angel investing is? Uh, Leah, Paula, which one of you wants to handle that? I'm happy to go. So basically, angel investing is uh, kind of a self-important term, uh, I think, as an <laughs> English major. Uh, it is the concept that uh, someone who believes in a founder's idea generally before they are, if they are building a software uh, company or a hardware company for that matter, before their product exists, before they have customers, before they have um, what we call in venture revenue and traction, which really just means they are making money at the, at the most simple terms. Before any of that happens, they have an idea and they have a personal track record maybe you know they have worked at a company that you think is interesting and relevant to their idea maybe they're just a friend who you really believe in um in the case of extremely privileged people who generally tend to fit into you know generational wealth maybe they are your family uh which is where the term family and friends came from which has kind of been replaced by this term of angel uh which i'm not sure it's any better but frankly it just <laughs> means um you're putting money in at that conceptual stage. You're saying to a founder, usually, um, I will give you money 
on what we would call either you know a safe or a convertible note, which basically just means before the company uh, has had a price round wherein there are shares um, of equity, you're basically giving money that is um, at its core a promise that you will receive shares in the future should the company go on to um, to raise more money. Um, and so usually uh, the value of angel investing um, is that because you know venture venture investing of all levels is about risk reward. Um, it's pro it, it's arguably the highest risk because there's absolutely no guarantee uh, of any type of success. Usually you're not even seeing any customers uh, willing to pay quite yet. Uh, but that means that you could have the highest reward because you know you might you might get to own a percentage, a, a part of the company for the least amount of money um, in the long run. Um, and so that's why it's kind of awesome for uh, someone like me didn't have a ton of money to invest, you know, at a series D round when to get the same amount you could get as an angel, you might have to put in a million dollars. Maybe if you put in a thousand dollars at that earliest stage, you have a lot to lose, but you also have a lot more to gain at a lower price. So that's kind of how angel investing works. Thanks so much, Leah. Um, last question on terminology. Paula, maybe you can help me out here. What the heck is a cap table? What does that mean? Wait, can someone else answer that one? Because it'll be so much more succinct. <laughs> <what I'm> <laughs> sure. um, a cap table stands for a capitalization table. And that just means essentially how is equity broken up? Who owns what percentage of the company? Um, and you know that helps in terms of when the company either IPOs or gets acquired, right? How much are people going to get based on percentage of their ownership? So it's really just TLDR ownership table yeah, price <laughs> shares yeah. a fancy so, spreadsheet yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. a fancy spreadsheet <laughs> i mean yeah um awesome so now that we're all good on um on, on terminology feel free to drop in the chat or the q a if you if there's a term you hear that you don't understand and we'll pause we'll do it um but let's start getting into the meat a little bit of the logistics um so this is a question I've approached many different times, but I'd like to hear your thoughts as well. Um, how much money do I need to start investing? Either crowdfunding or angel investing? Um, Cause I know that's a different amount, but like, what do I need? Well, I know Cheryl spoke a little bit about the um, requirements for being an accredited investor in the US, which hopefully will be changing over time. Um, I think lately different platforms have been popping up that allow you to contribute smaller dollar amounts, be that um, an SPV or kind of a pooling together of investors into one entity or um, a platform that allows for crowdfunding in the equity space or what you're speaking about, Cheryl. Um, I know that I've come across platforms such as like an iFundWomen, for example, which allows you to participate in a raise without committing too, too, too much money up front. Um, I think that's definitely going to be a trend going forward, and hopefully, more opportunities will pop up to allow um, allow people to do so. Wait, let me just clarify though. iPhone Woman is rewards crowdfunding, so Republic is equity crowdfunding. So, um, oh, once yeah, again, yeah, it's yeah. a matter no, of no yeah, means it, it. yeah. So it's not necessarily investing. I think it's more donating, right? That's the whole point is that we get confused a lot of times with donating versus actually investing, which is the whole point is that you actually will get a return in the future. Or at least that's the hope. <laughs> so um, just, just want to clarify yeah, on that yeah. side. And, and it, yeah, and then for us, I guess what what's really key here is that um, as someone mentioned in the chat, there are hundreds of companies now on the public, which by the way, if you talk to us mm -hmm. when COVID started, <laughs> I was on ND.com because like we were barely like making any money at all, right? Everything was frozen. Nobody knew what was going to happen. Like, I, I, we were we were truly paralyzed because nobody knew what the world was going to do. Um, now we're moving millions of dollars a day, <laughs> thank God. Um, but essentially, what what it like what ended up happening was these four trends, right? People are starting to realize they're consumers, but they want to be owners. They are also wanting to diversify their portfolios. Founders are starting to realize that it's actually a defensible strategy to engage the communities early and have them be brand ambassadors for them, especially if they're they're tied to the financial success of the company. And then last but not least is alternative assets. 
So everyone is looking for ways to invest in the hot deals of NFTs and crypto and yada, yada, yada. yada. I don't even know. <laughs> like we have startups, we have real estate, we have crypto, we have video game financing. We have we're a couple more on the way. So I think we're really trying to become that um, investing infrastructure for, for all things private and private companies. And so, uh, yeah, you don't, you don't have to have that much money. Uh, I think what's really cool is that you are able to, um, really put like $50, hundred dollars and build your own portfolio and then kind of track it over time. There is a long time, right? Like VCs, you know, put in money and they expect their return in five to 10 years. So you really want to make sure that if you do invest, whatever you invest, you invest and you just know that kind of locked away for a while. Um, but that's the whole point, right? You diversify sometimes in public markets, private markets, and, and you know, work from there. Yeah. And I, I think yeah, it will absolutely look different for everybody. Yeah. And an important note kind of here is like, I wrote a piece on angel investing, as I mentioned, and I interviewed maybe 10 people and surveyed about 50. And I asked kind of what stage of does your wallet, need, like what state does your wallet need to be in to start angel investing in particular? So angel investing works a little bit differently. You're, you're not necessarily going to be able to, to just invest 50 to $100. Usually not how it works, uh, particularly because there's quite a lot of regulation around uh, who, how many people can be on your cap table. So if you're taking those really small checks in a traditional way, that's that's much more difficult. Um, but when I, again, not investment advice, but when I, uh, when I spoke to people about this, they were kind of like, oh, you, um, secure your bag first. That was kind of the, the rule of thumb, like max your 401k, max your IRA, then start looking at alternative assets. Um, can mean anything from, you know, Bitcoin all the way to, to angel investing. Um, just making sure that your future and your life is first is really pertinent to a lot of us. You're going to probably make a lot more in compound interest from the $6,000 in your IRR and the $2,000 you invest in a startup. <laughs> yeah. And I would um, add, I know we can, we can probably dive into this later, but Another way um, that you can invest in early stage startups or angel invest without being an accredited investor, without having uh, whatever, it's like something crazy, like I'm over a million dollars in assets, but it can't include real estate, which is like, first of all, if I ever have that, it would be in real estate. So it's not like I'm just, <laughs> most people aren't sitting on a million dollar painting or something of the sorts um, or making over 200K, which is also a very small minority of the country is through um, syndicates. And so syndicates are really interesting. Basically what they are is um, a group investing in, um, a group investing in a company kind of as a united entity. And so mm -hmm. it's any anyone can theoretically put together a syndicate. There's, uh, I'll share an awesome guide that uh, a friend of mine, Paige, put together. She just graduated college like last year and she's already raising her own fund. She's incredible. And so she can make it accessible. Okay. Uh, as as uh, people who are a little further along, um, I admire her a lot. But basically the, the way that I made my first angel investments was kind of by doing the work of a, of a, of a venture investor uh, without being part of a fund. So if you find a company that you think is very interesting, you can send it, um, is portfolio considered a syndicate? Um, I think yes and no. Uh, I just saw that in the chat. We can get to that in a minute. But basically, if you source a deal, if you were to go to someone who is a um, an investor at a venture fund and say, I think this deal is really interesting, and they decide to invest in it, there is potential that you could invest a couple, uh, a couple hundred dollars up to a couple thousand dollars within their investment as part of their syndicate. And so your individual name will not appear on the cap table, but you will appear as part of this united group or um, it can be somebody who is a high net worth individual who decides that they will basically sponsor, for lack of a better word, um, the syndicate, which means that should uh, something financially go wrong, that they would be mo they would be uh, monitored by the IRS or whoever, not you. Um, and so basically, they then say to the company, if the company agrees to it, you have 200k worth of allocation in this round, you can go fill it with whoever you want. So you, you, you know, me as someone who's not accredited, I can put in $1,000, you can put in $1,000. 
and we can all chip in a small amount and all be bundled under this kind of uh, group syndicate. And when when returns ultimately get paid out, they sort of just get paid to the the syndicate, and then that gets divided in dividends based off of um, respective ownership of how much you put in. So it's something um, that you know the guy that I shared by by page does a really good job explaining. It. You can look a lot into it, but it is another way to get involved without being credited yourself. Also, shameless plug: Page has released a book, a children's book for adults on like intro to investing, and when that comes out, you should get it. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be so good. To follow for sure. She's she's up and God coming. bless her. <laughs> um, yeah. So like, let's. Like, let's talk a little bit about deal flow because like, yeah, we can put money places, but how do we know where to put it? So like, where's that deal flow coming from and how does that work as like a regular ass person? You know what I mean? Like, how do I get deal flow? So I think my experience with it probably looks a little bit different from Leah and Cheryl, just given um, their professional kind of exposure. Um, for me, it sounds silly, but I became an investor by literally being super fan of a brand. Like if, if it's something that, it's something that all of my portfolio companies have in common, be it like ice cream or coffee, it's mostly in the consumer space just because that familiarity to me brings me a lot of comfort. I mean, yes, I can, you know, anyone can invest in kind of these trendier or, you know, more complicated areas. I find that to be a little, bit out of my league currently, um, not to say that I can't shift that way. But for me, um, the consumer section has just been a little bit more accessible. Um, like I said, I'm in New York, I'm in Brooklyn, I am lucky to have to be a part of kind of this New York kind of entrepreneurial investor ecosystem, I guess you can call it. It's just kind of where, you know, my where my friends operate friends of friends. And um, it it kind of becomes a little bit of like a word of mouth thing um, where I really invest in just like getting myself out there, sending that first awkward email, learning about different companies um, and just kind of getting out there. I mean, I think that there are certain groups that I've aligned myself with. Uh, one woman that comes to mind, Leah, you were speaking about kind of this SPV investment structure is Annie Evans from Green Ventures. She does this. Um, and I can put it in the chat, uh, kind of aggregating small investors, a lot of first time investors. Um, so it's just being a part of this, again, weird word to use, but like ecosystem and just really plugging myself in. And even though it feels like awkward and scary and out of my league sometimes, it's just how I've really kind of learned and gotten started. What about you, Leah? Um, what's your kind of gut check on how you get, how a regular person gets deal flow? Yeah, sorry, I was just typing out a response on the portfolio question, but I'm going <laughs> to link here as well. Um, so how to get deal flow as a regular person? Um, deal flow to me, uh, like primarily came from my experience as a journalist. And my experience as a journalist is very similar to my experience as an investor, which is basically if you want to find um, up and coming things, you really need to keep your nose to the ground and do the work. Um, I'm not going to lie. It's not easy to just like, you don't get to just say, I'm interested in venture investing and see all of the coolest early stage things just come to you. Maybe if you're like Serena Williams, that happens. But um, for anyone else, unless your name is so valuable to have on a cap table that people will come to you, which no offense, uh, most of us aren't, myself included. Um, you have to go out and really be kind of like a truffle pig sort of with your nose to the ground. For me, um, being a journalist was one way to get at that because people like to be written about. Um, and so that's part of the reason why I am not uh, reporting on companies that I cover because that's a conflict of interest. But basically, when you have a public platform, like you have a blog that you run all the time, or you even if you have more of a public presence on social media and gain a following, having that kind of um, think of it as like a platform that you can broadcast from helps people come to you because they say, you know, oh, I really love um, Koki's blog. And I would love if like maybe when she's writing about fintech companies, she mentioned me or she mentioned my early stage company and what I'm what I'm working on. Um, then I'm more inclined to DM her on Twitter or whatever and be like, hey, I really love what you're working on. I, you know, 
this is this is what I'm working on. And maybe from there, she becomes more interested in potentially investing along with covering or promoting what you're working on. But I would say that if you don't already have a public platform, one of the best ways to get involved is to just sort of like plug yourself in in the social networks um, where these conversations are happening. I think it's like an annoying piece of advice to plug Twitter, but Twitter has been really helpful for me. Finding a couple nodes um, who are women angel investors, non-binary angel investors, male angel investors who you admire, who you find your values align with, even if they're like 50 years along in the journey comparative to you, uh, following them, uh, trying to get a sense of who they're following um, and starting to reach out for informational conversations, I think is really valuable. Um, and then there are also some really amazing groups that have cropped up. There's um, I don't identify as Gen Z, but a friend started a Gen Z um, investment group. That's like a, it's like a Slack uh, community now, and they are sharing a lot of deals there. So there's a lot of these kind of groups that you can plug in, whether they're affinity based um, or not. I think that are pretty interesting. Um, and yeah, I would say my, my first ever angel investment, which was in Naj Austin, the founder of Ethel's Club and now Somewhere Good, came because I saw her name referenced in an article. And in that article, she said, I'll never accept venture investment. And I just DM'd her and was like, hey, I realize you probably don't want to talk to me. I am not a professional investor, but I just think that what you're working on sounds really cool. Maybe we could get coffee sometime. We ended up becoming really good friends and I sourced uh, started sending her company to people who were venture capitalists on Twitter and she ended up getting her first 100k check through that and I invested through that syndicate. So I think it's like that type of groundwork that uh, that can lead to opportunities. Awesome. Um, this has actually swollen my already over large head um, because I just started getting deal flow all the time and I can't tell what it was, but I think I was giving off a rich vibe, um, which I didn't think I had, but like dead ass, like it was just flying in and I didn't know what to do with it. Anyway, here we are. Um, great points. Um, so like now that I've found my opportunity, right? Like what should I be looking for before I make an investment? Like what should I gut check myself on? Cheryl, what do you think? Yeah, just FYI, we get over 5,000 applications a year, if not more, that's outdated probably because we've like tripled our, our deal flow. So um, we do the <laughs> hard work for y'all and put the, the best companies, 3% of the companies that we see are generally on the platform. So, uh, you know, I think for any company uh, that you're evaluating, it really has to come down to what you personally believe in. Um, it kind of similar to Paula, by the way, like there is some time I actually have been a customer of some like consumer products or some fintech products. And I've literally been like, I love you. You're getting my money anyway. Let me just, just go on Republic and then I can actually invest in you. Like it's those type of things. And, and by the way, some of them have right status money. Um, one that's coming up in the onboarding is, is one that I like literally give all my money to in Whole Foods. So like, it's, it's great that like, you know, you can become a customer and then get, you know, to invest in them later. But uh, things that I think resonate for me are just more about like the team, right? We call it the four T's, the team. So are they, do they have a unique insight that will allow them to, uh, you know, grow this company into a unicorn. So unicorn just meaning a company that has a billion dollar valuation. Um, and also, you know, can't do they have the skill set to take it to that level because you know iterations of a startup or a private company they go through so many like evolution that <laughs> like and through a real evolution of different stages and so um you know having confidence in the team is, is key the second one is traction so whether you're comfortable with a pre-revenue pre-product uh, company or i generally personally like more post product post revenue um that just means that they already have an mvp and that they're already in market um and they're making money which is always very good <laughs> so um there's that uh then it's tech tech or product so like whether or not you believe in the product whether you think that there's a need for it in the market the market is huge and then last but not least is theme so whether you are more focused on consumer like i'm fo very focused on femtech and silver tech two very specific uh verticals and so um i i am of the belief that if you specialize in particular verticals you're able to then 
you know, see iterations, you know, kind of quote unquote pattern matching, but like, let's not get into the bias of that. Um, and then over time, you're able to, um, you know, make a smart investments. And so those are the four T's um, that I like to go over on Republic. Every single campaign page is kind of like a pitch deck. So it's literally structured as like the problem, solution, traction, all of this type of thing. And then at the very bottom, what you can do is you can ask questions. Ask questions to the founders. You can look at other people who have asked their questions to the founders um, and kind of learn over time, you know, how to be a really good investor that can ask really great questions. And then you can all see reviews and kind of the reason why other people invested there. So um, that's a little bit about that. Awesome. Yeah, what do you I would look add, for, Paula? Um, I I would add, so I'm I'm also a really big fan of the data, right? Like when I'm Im evaluating a company, I'm going to dig it into the numbers. I'm going to look at other companies in the space, how much they've raised, how are they using their capital, all of those kind of um, technicalities. But at the end of the day, I I have to really trust the people behind it. If I'm gonna if I'm gonna get behind a company, I'm gonna um, I don't know, I'm gonna write a check to a company that is serving a larger mission, that the founders are people that I can get behind beyond just the product that they're creating. Um, and I think a lot of that is just is just fit um, in, what you, in, in what you encounter, but um, kind of being a super fan, for lack of a better word, of the, of the companies I've chosen to invest in gives me so much comfort in, in, tr in trusting the founders, trusting management, and trusting that the dollars that, I mean, we collectively as investors are putting towards their efforts and their missions are are going to go the farthest that they can go for sure there's a people fit there that's really important beyond just the analytics for sure leah what do you think yeah so just to i was i was very engrossed in what you were saying i also needed to get a charger for my computer so i apologize that <laughs> um but so the initial question was kind of around like what what your what core things you're evaluating when considering a company cool um so I would definitely amplify everything that's already been said. I agree. Um, as someone who is, uh, to be transparent, not great with data and numbers, um, which is sort of ironic about this job, uh, part of why I really like the earliest stage investing is because it's generally not based off of numbers. It's based off of um, more conceptual factors, such as the ones discussed, but also we we talk a lot um at next view and i think a lot about as an angel what is uh what is the market that we're trying to play in right now and is it getting bigger and if so how is it evolving and how is this company or team develop how does their idea develop kind of compounding advantages over time um in venture we use a term that i think is kind of funny called uh like a moat and it basically means um, what it sounds like. Uh, if you have a castle, the moat is what uh, theoretically keeps you safe. Uh, if somebody else tries to come, can be with you, they fall into it. Um, and so I think something that is challenging about angel investing when um, you're not working with a, a professional team of investors is that it can be easy to try to follow uh, like quote unquote hot trends um, but hot trends oftentimes invite competition, which can be both good and bad. So if you really want to invest in an NFT company, for example, or if you really want to invest in, um, I don't know, like a, a sustainable clothing brand or something of the sorts, you need to think about how long term is this company going to be doing things and hiring people and relying on their own internal strengths as operators to ensure that they are owning more and more of this expanding pie, not that they are so good at what they do that they invite uh, imitation and that imitation starts um, eating them alive. And I think that that is uh, oftentimes a conceptual thing, but you can ask questions around, uh, what is your strategy to go to market? What are you going to do to quickly acquire um, the right customers, a lot of customers, it might be one or both of those things, uh, and then long term, what is your what is your strategy or vision for how your product or your team evolves to ensure that you are continuing to acquire more and more, not just kind of leveling out? Because for an angel investment to make sense, unlike, uh, you know, a, a investing in a public market where you can put in a little and it will grow steadily over time, you really need to do things that result in 
exponential growth in a shorter period of time of, you know, five to 10 years, not uh, 50 to 100 years. Yeah, I love this panel because I just learned I'm a bad investor. Um, <laughs> I invest with my gut and with mission. Um, I think that, like, nine, you know, this is like a crapshoot nine times out of 10. <laughs> it's like part one is do I fuck with you? And part two is like, does this fuck with yeah. me? Like, I'm really that's that's how I do this. Um, might want to reevaluate. I love that criteria. Oh, like, <laughs> I can that vibes, there's, no matter how good it, I, there's been so many you know, investment conversations with my team where I'm like, great idea, great market, great strategy, but like just horrible vibes from this team, which is usually yeah, no vibes. white men who have no self-awareness. And honestly, at the Shock. end of the day, no idea is that creative that someone else won't think about it. So we, we always say like, right race, wrong horse, like let's wait until we find someone better to work on this idea. Yeah, for and sure. you get that I, vibe, and and God forbid, fast forward however many months, years, whatever, and you're like, oh, my gut check was correct. Like I've had mm -hmm. that moment too, right? Where you can't quite put the words to it, but it just makes sense internally. And I think you need to respect that for sure. Also, given that this is a panel by women for women on women, you know, investing, your gut is so good. Your gut has been good since you were a little tiny thing, like you already know, <laughs> trust your gut. Um, I also, yeah, my first angel investment was when I cried at the deck and I love the founders, um, which is embarrassing, but I cried at a deck. So if anyone's wondering how my mental state is, that's where we're at. Um, Let's talk a little really, bit. Like, when I met Naj though, like the first time I met her, it's just like, sometimes you just have to trust your gut. You meet somebody at coffee and you're like, holy shit, I'm so impressed by this person. Like, I would, uh, there's some test that some fancy dude at a fund told one of my partners that they told me, which is the test of like, if you met this person after 30 minutes, would you be comfortable giving them $500 of your own money and walking away and just checking back in 10 years and being confident mm -hmm. that this person is so good that they'll do, it might not be the exact idea they pitch you and nine times out of 10, it's not going to be, it might not be the exact product, but you just have a feeling like I trust this person. Uh, as someone who's not the, the the best at finance necessarily, like there are tons of people that I trust with my with my money, but more than I trust myself. And she was one of those people. So I would encourage you to trust your gut if you have the capital to spare. For sure, absolutely. Um, and that's like the that's the thing I really want you guys to walk away with, like this panel from. You know, like I want you to know that like trusting yourself is really important, <laughs> and that's like most of this process, right? Um, can we talk a little bit about something I don't really understand? Uh, how are valuations determined? What does that mean? Sometimes you just put your finger up in the air and you're like, okay, this sounds about right. Like, <laughs> I mean, right now, like the, the market is crazy. I think there's so much capital right now flowing around that um, good companies are generally getting really favorable valuations there are company there are venture uh venture capitalists that are going downstream in order to capitalize some of that upside um sorry when i say that i mean that like they generally invest later stage so like series b c when the company already has traction and everything but since they're seeing that the valuations are so high they're actually going towards more pre-seed and seed because because of this cap table, right? They want to get as much ownership as possible for the money that they have. Um, hopefully that was a good explanation, but uh, sorry about that. So anyway, I would just say, um, essentially valuations, right? At the end of the day are like, how much is this company worth, right? If they were to sell right now, like, and how much percentage then based off of that you would get. Um, and so it's just a matter of the market. Uh, sometimes there's so much demand, it's a hot space like NFTs, and so uh, founders are able to get higher valuations so that they can keep more of the company, right? Um, and that, you know, venture capitalists can come in at, at a higher price uh, versus, you know, <laughs> ed tech for a while was not hot at all, not sexy, no one was looking at that. And then all of a sudden the pandemic happened and then psh, valuation skyrocketed because everyone realized how incredible or how important ed tech is, um, education tech. And so I think, it really is more like I wish I could give you like a strict formula <laughs> around it. Um, there are different ways of calculating valuations. 
Um, I'll actually drop a link to our angel investing masterclass that we have at Republic. Um, we're a week four now, but um, there's different ways to calculate it. But at the end of the day, it's more just about market conditions. Awesome. Anything to add, Paula, Leah? I would say like getting into venture valuations were the thing that intimidated me the most. And I just want to like make space for the reality that oftentimes they are numbers like pulled out of thin air based off of nothing that are used to justify keeping people like me who are afraid of the concept of evaluation out of venture investing. So like, fuck that. Don't let that hold you back. Like, please know that there is some value to valuations. There's also a lot of bullshit around it. And most of the companies that post evaluation are not actually worth that much money and never will be. And it's just used as a gatekeeping mechanism a lot of the times. That being said, having been in uh, the industry for a bit, it's actually not that complicated. It's not as complicated as it seems most of the time. Usually evaluation is a negotiation between a venture investor and a founder based off of how much the venture investor wants to own percentage wise of the company. They usually have, uh, for example, seed stage companies usually want to own, say, 10 to 15 percent of a company. Be they want to own that at the earliest stage because they know the company is going to raise more money down the line. The pot expands. That means your part of it dilutes. It just is worth less. So if you don't get that 10 to 15 percent up front, you're not going to have something meaningful by the time there is a liquidation event, which just means money gets distributed. And so all the valuation really means is it's a negotiation. If I want 10 percent and you say the company is worth, you know, a hundred million dollars, then maybe my 10% is not enough. But so maybe I want to pull the valuation down because if the valuation is $20 million, then my 10% is worth a lot more money. And so it's really just that push and pull of the venture investor always wants to bring the valuation down so that their percentage is worth more. The founder usually wants to bring the valuation up so that they mm -hmm. own more of the company and so that that 10% is less valuable. And so it's just the push and pull between that dynamic that is really what you need to know. And the, the all the rest of it is kind of like semantics at the end of the day. Yeah, that's, um, that's actually super helpful. Thank you so much. Um, I guess as we're getting to the end here, we have about five minutes left that really flew. Um, can we talk about some of the blockers for women trying to get on cap tables today? Like what's in our way and how do I, how do I break it with a bat essentially? Anyone? <laughs> Sorry, I was just waiting for other folks to come in. Um, no, I, right, I was just reading the you know I can talk all the time. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I would say, I think, well, one, Republic really tries to make it as accessible as possible. We try to break it down in, in layman's terms, and we really want it to be not as scary. Um, quite frankly, like, when I first learned about this, I was like, wait, what's B2B? What's, like, what? Like, I, I'm, I was just so confused about the terminology, because it is daunting. Um, and I think, especially as women, too, we, um, we're very cautious when it comes to money, uh, you know, I think we all know the systemic problems around uh, that in the first place, and you know we are not as trusting. Um, but I think um, over time, like we we will only put our money into things that we fully understand, and that's something where you know, especially for startup investing and private companies, like this is all very very new, and so it really does take time, and it takes more um, more of just that constant repetition of looking at deals to feel comfortable to actually go ahead and and then uh invest in, in startups and so um the work that we do is all about awareness education focused on um you know making sure that people know that this is even an option right uh people basic finance has been such a struggle especially in america like we are not taught about it in, in schools and um you know people are just starting to get into the public markets and then we're talking about the private markets and then they're like wait there are two like wait what's going on what what is this um and so to, to koki's point actually prior when she was like you know first make sure you're paying off your debts 
you know, then make sure that you, you are starting to invest in some of the like less riskier assets and then go to the more risky assets. So we're already like at the stage we're talking about already when you've done all of that. Right. And a lot of people in this country are not at that stage yet. So all I'm trying to say here is that when you are have that disposable income um, to really consider a startup investing and private investing as a whole um, as an asset class where you can put in part of your money uh, into and to you know not be as afraid of it as um, you know, because it, it, it does sound daunting, but over time um, it actually just becomes uh, something that, that can be second nature. That's awesome. Do you guys have any additional thoughts, Leah, Paula? Yeah, I think um, what Cheryl said really resonates. And um, what stands what stands in the way, I think, is like goes back to basics a lot of the time. I think, as Cheryl mentioned, like we have real systemic issues with financial literacy and education and public school education, especially in this country. And also we're living in a system wherein non-white people have been systemically deprived of capital for and of intergenerational wealth. And when we talk about intergenerational wealth, we also mean the education that comes along with that oftentimes about what to do with your money. Um, that has been deprived to a majority of the country at this point for for decades, if not centuries. And so what do we do with that? I think the best thing that we can do, the best thing that I did, because leaving, you know, college in a lot of ways, I felt very financially illiterate and very burdened by fi financial responsibilities is to just start reading um, and, you know, Googling and buying books, you know, finance for beginners, uh, investing for beginners, like don't, um, I have a book called Naked Economics that was one of the first books that I read after college because like that was not the education that I received in college for better or for worse. And just, you know, taking it really slow and trying to understand the basics of how the economic system in this country works before, and that's kind of what Cheryl's getting out of like, before we start putting money that we do or don't have into really, really high risk, really uncertain public uh, and private market investments, let's understand like the base level of the house and then you know work your way up and so i found that once i finally got a conceptual grasp of like how the economy works um at, at a most basic level i was able to get a little bit more comfortable with investing in uh you know retirement accounts and then investing in mutual funds and and stocks and working my way up to feeling comfortable with such a one-off investment because it's really infrequent that you know most people will make an investment in a single company because that it's just so high risk there's no dif there's no diversification whereas in a mutual fund or a retirement account you do have that so i i would just emphasize like the biggest barrier is often education and access to information and the internet does help with that so i would just if you're feeling overwhelmed of where to start just start with the basics and guys were and, and we're events like time. this i mean platform go ahead mm. no please no just that like i mean even tonight looking at this chat is super encouraging right sharing the information surrounding yourself with people who are also curious and also super knowledgeable in this space is going to go so far for sure um we're at time here. I, I can't echo that enough. What Paula just said that this is this has been really encouraging to see people really engage with the topic. We're we're so happy you were able to join us. Um, I want to thank our three panelists for being lovely, brilliant, funny, sweet, um, and outstanding. Um, can't wait to uh, to hear more and learn more from all three of you on Twitter. They've all dropped their links in the chat, so stalk them, I guess. Um, and thank you so much. The ladies get paid for having us. We love the mission, and we'd love to see it. Keep coming together. We're rooting for you. Thanks, everyone. And thanks for joining. Thanks so much, everybody. Take care. Stay safe.